praise the Lord and good evening. I'm welcoming you to our Thursday evening Bible study at Cross Life Fellowship Church in Tuttle, Oklahoma. Welcome everybody who's here, everybody who's listening later on through YouTube. We uh, had a little bit of a glitch last week in our recording. If you've seen the video, um, it cut us off there at about verse 4 or 5 or so. So we're going to do a little bit of a recap this evening and look at what was, uh, what was missed in that video for the benefit of those who may not be able to, to be here on Thursday evening and for the benefit of those of us who are still here because there's always more that we can see in the Word of God. There's always more to bring out. We can't ever cover all of it all at once. And so we'll pick up there in uh, chapter 3 there at verse 4 and then we'll move on. We're, we'll be going into looking at the church of Philadelphia uh, this evening as we as we move forward in our study here the book of Revelation so I just want to welcome everybody and let's just take a time of prayer here this morning or this evening and we'll get started father we thank you Lord this evening we thank you for the privilege of coming before you father we thank you Lord that you have given us your word Lord and that we can draw everything that we need for life and godliness Lord that it's found in Christ it's found in your word because he is your word your, the, 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 the Word of God declares that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word came and dwelt among us. And Father, we just thank You this evening for the opportunity, Lord, to look into Your Word and to understand and to know You, Father. In Jesus' name, Amen and Amen. So, picking up there in chapter 3. Looking there at the church at Sardis in verse 4, we'll just go ahead and back up there because that, that's a, a, a better place, I guess you could say. And as well, it, it kind of leads in to what we'll see there in the church in Philadelphia. And beginning there in verse 4, you know, we covered a little bit of that last week, but we're going to cover, recap it just now. He says, Thou hast a few names. This is Jesus speaking there to the church at Sardis. He says, Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. There's a lot said here in this fourth verse. There's a few. There's a, a remnant. God has a remnant. And each one of these, these uh, churches that we've seen here, there has always been a remnant and there's always been a promise to those that overcome. And whenever we understand that, you know, whenever we see that, when it says those that overcome, that means that there is an overcomer. There is victory. That overcoming is victory. And that victory is found in Christ. He is our victory. God has a prescribed way. He has an order for us to live our lives. And when we live our lives in God's order, in God's way, we are assured of victory. And God's way is faith in who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us at the cross. That's God's only way. That's the only way of victory. That's the only way to overcome. To overcome what? Overcome every wile of the enemy. Overcome the principalities and the powers of the air. To overcome self. That's our biggest problem is self. And the only way to be overcomers is for our faith to remain and rest. We'll see that there in Philadelphia. It's for us to rest in who Christ is, for us to be steadfast in our faith and to not veer from that faith in Christ and not mix. That's a, a problem, was a problem in these churches. It was a problem in the church, the, 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 the first century church, as Paul would write many of his letters to those churches where, where there would be like the Judaizers would come in and other the Gnostics and others would come in teaching what Paul would say were damnable heresies trying to lead astray God's people. You see, the enemy, he can't stop you from getting saved, but once you are saved, he can try to get you off course. He can try to get you to veer away from the way of faith in Christ to putting our faith in other things because he knows that a believer, a church, that's, that's faith is, is misplaced, their faith that's in something else, they will not have the help and the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. They'll just be leaving or living a mediocre, if you will, Christian life. They'll be living a defeated Christian life. And, and the enemy wants you defeated so that you'll quit and give up. You'll surrender and go back to your old life. And in that, he, he, he wins a victory. 
But if we will remain steadfast over and over in the Word of God, we, we see to remain steadfast, to be on guard and to keep the Word of God. And that's what he's speaking of here. He says there's a few names, there's that remnant even in Sardis, in that place where there was just wickedness and, and, and all kinds of, of, of other immoral things going on there. And he says, even in Sardis, which have not defiled, that word defiled there means to be spotted, means to be soiled. In Ephesians 5 it says that he might present to himself, speaking of the church, a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Those who are holy and without blemish are those whose faith has remained in Christ. That's what he's looking for. He's looking for our faith. He's not looking for our works. He, he knows every work. So each one of these letters, he said, I know your works. I know what you're doing. He knows what's going on, but he's looking for our faith. Amen. He's looking for us to say, Lord, I don't, whatever happens, whatever comes my way, whatever the trial, the tribulation, Lord, I'm not quitting. I'm not giving up. I'm going to keep trusting in you. I'm going to keep holding on to you and keep my faith in you. So you have a few names in Sardis which have not defiled their garments. I think we covered a little bit of that last week, those garments. What's that talking about? That's talking about being clothed in the righteousness of Christ. You know, when Adam was created, Adam was clothed in God's righteousness. He didn't know he was naked till after he sinned. Then it says his eyes were opened, you know. And, and, and they saw that they were naked and then they went about. They were naked before God. They saw themselves you know, undone, before God saw them clothed in His righteousness. See, that's what God wants to see in us. And then those of us who have put our faith in Christ, even now, you know, God sees us not as we are now. We're still flawed now. We still have problems now. We still have what we would say are issues. Brother Swaggart would say it's the clinging vines of the fall. We still have things in each one of our lives that the Holy Spirit wants to work out of us if we'll yield to Him and allow Him to. But you see, these garments, we are, God sees us as clothed. He sees us in the manner in which He originally created mankind because our, we have put our faith in Christ. And we talked, I think, some last week about that, that, that that blood of Christ washes us. It cleanses us. I said you know, here a few weeks ago, it's like tide. It takes out every stain. You know, just to put it in something that we can bring down to our level today. It, it washes. It doesn't cover the stain. It doesn't just blot the stain out. It covers. It washes it clean as if it was never there. That's what that blood of Jesus Christ does for us. And that's why how God sees us. He says, they have not defiled their garments. They've kept the faith is what he's talking about there. And they shall walk with me in white. I looked up that white and it talks about glimmering. It talks about a shimmering light. It, that's, that's that white, that righteousness of God. He says, for they are worthy. How are they worthy? They are worthy because Jesus Christ and what He did for us at Calvary. That's the only way that we can be worthy. That's the only way that we can be seen as worthy in God's eyes is to be in Christ Jesus. I think we covered some of that last week. We're in Christ. We're, we're not in ourselves. We're not in Adam. But we are resting. That's what that end speaks of. It speaks of resting in Him, trusting in Him for all that He has done for us. We're not trusting in our own works. You see, our works are, as, what does it say, uh, as, as filthy rags. All our righteousness is as filthy. Our works of righteousness are as filthy, dirty, stinking, rotten rags in the sight of God. But what Jesus did for us at Calvary, that makes us worthy. That makes us righteous. That we might walk with Him. What's that walk? Walk talks about carrying out our life. Carrying out our existence. He's speaking of our eternity. He's speaking of our life now as well. But He's speaking of our eternity as well. That we might walk. We might continue to live with Him in righteousness. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, verse 5, I think that's where we cut off. And then that's the, that, that verse 5, he, He's covering... 
the things that you know, he has said, and we covered a little bit, he said, He that overcometh, we can all be overcomers. We can all overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. We can all overcome self in Christ. You see, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that's the only way we can overcome by what He's done for us. He says, The same shall be clothed in white. He that overcometh the same, that same one shall be clothed in white raiment. That speaks of that, as we said again. He's emphasizing this over and over here in verses 4 and 5. It, it, it's, it's, it's something we need to hear, we need to see, we need to understand. The same shall be clothed in white raiment. And then he says, And I will not... Mm, I will not blot out his name. And we talked about that. It, it probably got cut off on the video. But I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Hear what that's saying. It says, just as he says he won't blot it out, those who have not kept the faith, we'll see it here in Philadelphia in a few minutes, those who have been led astray, those who have because of false teachers been drawn apart, we need to understand, we are responsible, if you want to use that term, we are responsible to the Lord for our walk with the Lord. And, and what do I mean by The pastor is not responsible for how you walk with the Lord. The pastor is not responsible to get you to heaven. The pastor is not responsible to, uh, or, or grandma or anybody else is not responsible to see to it that they drag you along, you know, kicking and screaming into the portals of glory. Your walk with the Lord is a personal relationship. That's where I'm going with that. Your walk with the Lord is a one-on-one, -on -one, you and Him. You know, we've been going through Colossians, and, and one of the Colossian heresies was that of Gnosticism. And, and the Gnostics taught that you had to go through any number of intermediaries, any other, you know, of angels or other men or whatever it may have been, you had to go by way of them to get to Jesus. Whenever Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, no man comes to the Father but by me. We don't go through Paul and then Peter and then James and then finally get to Jesus. We don't go through any saint that the Catholic Church has drummed up or dreamed up out of their own imagination or whatever and, and pray to them. We don't go to pray to Mary and then be able to get to Jesus. We have the privilege because of what Christ did for us at Calvary that we can come boldly into the very presence of God, into His throne room of grace whenever we have times of need. I think we need to be there all the time because we always have a time of need. And we get to come, we get to come into His presence. And, he, and, and just as we are in His presence, just as we can have our names written in the book of life, our name can be blotted out from that book of life. Why? What would occasion that? Misplaced faith. You see, God works on the economy of faith. And he's looking for faith. The only faith God recognizes is faith in who Christ is and what Jesus did for us at Calvary. That's where he's told us. That's what the Old Testament sacrifices were about. That's what we are to have as the object. That, that, that phrase has been used and it's true. The object of our faith must be Christ and Him crucified alone for us to be found worthy, for us to have our name in the Lamb's Book of Life, and that's why so many warnings throughout the New Testament to watch, to be on guard, to stand fast, to not let any man, Colossians 2, don't let any man beguile you. That means to steal from you, to persuade you in any other direction. The direction is Christ and Him crucified. That's what, what He did. He says, I will not blot out His name out of the book of life. But I will confess His name before my Father and before His angels. He's going to say, Father, I know Him. I know her. I know who they are. They're the ones that, that, that have kept the faith. They put their trust in me. Yes, they are mine, is what Jesus will say. He is mine. I'm careful using they or them because of all the foolishness going on in the world today. You have to use those pronouns, whatever. But no, He will say, yes, He is mine. She is mine. Amen? 
That's what I want to hear. I want to hear him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. He says, I will confess his name before my father. That's, that before means in front of. In the very presence, in the very face of God, he will say, Yes, I know them. They have kept the faith. He says, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. And then another of the same admonition in every letter. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. I've said it every time we've looked at this. The Holy Spirit, the Lord is still speaking to his people. Do we have ears to hear? You see, that doesn't mean are you got these, but it means are you hearing what the Spirit says? Are you receiving it into your heart? Are you desiring to hear what the Spirit is saying? You know, he, 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 he completes each one of these letters with that same term, he that has an ear. You know, and in having that ear, we got to receive and hear the rebuke along with the promise. Maybe there's some things in our life that need some rebuke. Maybe there's some areas in our life, not maybe, but probably so. There are some areas in our life that we need to hear the rebuke of the Lord. And you know, he, he says often and many times, repent, remember from where you have received and heard and hold fast, there, verse 3, and repent. I've said it many times, I'll keep saying it, repentance is not a bad thing. Repentance is a good thing. If the Lord is saying repent, He's telling you you're going the wrong way to turn around. That's the love of God. God's love says repent. God's love says turn around. I love you too much. I paid too much of a price for your soul. Turn around. Don't go that way. Don't go that word of faith way. Don't go that way of, 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 of purpose driven that way. Whatever it might be. Don't go that way. But go the way of Christ and Him crucified. You see, this, this thing that right here in this verse 5, that very thing that your name could be blotted out, that throws Calvinism out the window. Because they say, oh, once you're saved, you're always saved. And then they'll try to use the excuse, oh, well, if they fall away, then they were never saved. That's not so either. How do you fall away from what you were never part of? Mm hmm. That's what that apostasy talks about. That's what you'll see there in the church of Laodicea. How can you fall away from what you never had? Therefore, that whole thing of they must not have ever been saved doesn't hold any water. Because if your name was written down, you see every name, every person, there's a new name written down in glory and it's mine. Oh yes, it's mine. That's a scriptural song. But if your name was written down, then you were saved. But if your name is blotted out, that means you've gone in another direction. Or as a, the threat of being blotted. That is, that is a, a, I don't know if you want to call it a threat, but that is a direct consequence of misplaced faith is that our name could be rotted, blotted out from the Lamb's book of life. Are we hearing what the Spirit is saying? Are we hearing what the Lord is telling us here? We need to wake up, church. We need to wake up and listen and whenever he, oh my, oh, the Holy Spirit doesn't convict of sin. There's another false teaching. That hyper grace and all that. mixed. They mix it with some truth. But the lie is bolder. The lie, the lie will do you, they will kill you even though there's truth mixed in there. Peanut butter is good, but you put arsenic in it, it's going to kill you. It's going to taste good. The, tr the truth is going to taste good. But when they put the lie in there, you won't taste that lie but it'll bring death to you. Amen? Amen. Amen. So picking up now in the church of Philadelphia, chapter 3, verse 7. Again, the Lord, that church in Philadelphia. Philadelphia is one of two of the churches that He did not reprimand in any way. The church in Philadelphia, they say, um, as we begin this, they, they say that, that that church era or church age began along 1800 or so, somewhere 1700, 1800. And, and Philadelphia, they call it the missionary church because of what, what uh, took place there. But you know, this is still the church in Philadelphia, just like the church in Sardis, the church in Ephesus, whatever it was. There are still, if you will, uh, 
portions of each of those churches in the church today. Like I've said, you know, these, these are pictures of a predominant time frame in the church age, but they are as well a picture of the church in every age and at some stage. And, and I've said it before, I kinda, I'll say it again, that, that I think this is a, a picture too, or it can be a picture as well of our life as a believer. We began there at Ephesus, and then for whatever reason, we leave our first love, and then other things like this that we see in the other churches is what God is warning us about that can come about in our life. If you, I mean, just sit back and think about it for a minute. When Once you leave your first love, which is Christ and Him crucified, faith there, then all the other stuff, we are open game to be led astray by all the other false teaching from the Jezebels and, and, and such that, that was in the other churches. But if we'll repent, we can come back. But we're going to see here with the church of Philadelphia, they were not a big church. Mm, that should tell us something today. And pastors, don't worry about it if you don't have a big giant congregation. Because of what he says here in Philadelphia, as long as the congregation you do have is missionary minded, if, you, if they're out, not... Mm, we could say outreach, but ministry-minded, you know, not just us four and no more kind of an attitude. But so that church in Philadelphia, they say that was the missionary church. That could be the missionary-minded believer. It can be the church today. There is that aspect of the church today, of, 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 of sending out mission, the Great Commission, if you will. That's what this church was all about. It says, to the end, he didn't find anything wrong with these people with this church, but he made several promises to him. I want to be part of the church of Philadelphia today. A church that's, that's missionary minded, a church that's outreach, if you will, to, to see people saved, to draw them in, to call them to come to the Lord. He says, to the angel, when we understood that, we know that to be the pastor. We'll just stop there again. We recently got a... Uh, 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 a text from a brother in Africa saying, oh, I want to be under your church or something to that effect. And we, we told him, you know, everything we have is on YouTube or whatever and you can go get that for free, but we are all under the headship of Christ. And that's what we need to understand in each and every church that that pastor is to be under the headship of Christ and that church is under Christ's headship. That pastor is to be hearing from the Lord, not from headquarters, not from another group, not from another you know, a bunch of churches, denomination or whatever. We need to be hearing and seeking the Lord. There would be a whole lot less issues in the church today if pastors would seek the Lord rather than seeking fellow Pastor Bob over here or seminary professor over there or the general presbyter over here, whatever it might be, we need to be seeking the Lord. And if those other folks come in and confirm what the Lord has said, hey, that's fine and good. But if they don't, then we need to say, mm, sorry, I'm following the Lord. This is what the Lord, he has, he may have something different for us than he's got for the church across the street or down the road or, or, or across the country, whatever. We're not all to fit into the same pattern. You hear what I'm saying? We're, part of, we're all part of the body of Christ we're all to be busy with, with, with the missionary, with, with taking this gospel message to the world, but he may have us specifically ministering over here while another part of the body is ministering over here. And if we're all following the head, which is Christ, then everything is going to be taken care of because he's not going to let anything wane. He's not going to let anything be undone. Things go undone in the church because people won't hear from the Lord. They won't seek the Lord for themselves. Oh, I think a men's ministry would be great. You start it, brother. Go right ahead. Oh, no, I want you to do it. No, if he's put it on your heart, you do it. I'll certainly help you. I'll certainly be there to support you, but that'll be on you if you're hearing from the Lord for that. Just using that as an example. So, to the angel of the church at, F, at, at to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, I wanted to go all the way back to Ephesus there for a minute. To the church in Philadelphia, right. These things saith he that is holy. Hear what he's saying here. This is a picture of Christ. This is who he is. He that is holy. And, and we have the definite article here before holy and before true. He that is the holy one. And he that is the true one. He that is holy and he that is true. He that has the key of David. 
He that opens and no man shuts, and shuts and no man opens. God, Christ has that key. That key sim- symbolizes authority. It, it's a symbol of, of power. Christ, the one who is holy and true, He has the power to open doors and to shut doors, and no man can open or shut those doors that the Lord has done His will with. That he has, and that's what we see here, the headship of Christ. In the church, He will open up doors for us that He may not open up for the the church down the street. Or He may open up doors for them that He hasn't opened up for us. Amen? So He is the one who is in control. And that's why we need to seek His headship. He says that I have, He has the key of David. <clears throat> he that opens and no man shuts and shuts and no man opens. That God is in control, folks. He is all powerful, almighty. We, we get in a lot of trouble a lot of times because we go trying to open up doors that God has. He said, wait a minute. I'm not ready for you to go through that door yet. Or we go thinking, oh, I'm going to go do this and we put the foot to the door. Try to kick it in. And things fall apart in disaster because we didn't wait on the Lord. We didn't seek the Lord. You know, it. it I was reading something the other day. It was talking about, you know, we make our plans and then we ask God to bless them. Whenever we need to wait on God and hear from Him what His plan is, and then we are assured 100% of His blessing when we follow His plan. Be careful. Don't be kicking down no doors. You might end up in a big, big mess. At, 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 at least, at the very least, the very minimal, it's going to fail. But you may do more harm than good. You may cause more problems than, oh, you got ze- you're zealous. Yeah, we've been zealous before. All of us have. We've been zealous. We've been zealous to take the message of the cross and run some people away sometimes. You know, it's a learning process. Let the Lord be the leader. Verse 8, he said, I know thy works. Another term that he's used with every church. He knows what's going on in your life. He knows what's going on, what you're doing. He says, Behold, I have set before you an open door, and no man can shut it. And then this verse here, or this portion, For you have a little strength. Mm -mm -mm. You have a little strength. That means that there wasn't many of them. There aren't many in this day and age. What does it say? Uh, The laborer, the, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray the, the Lord of the harvest that He'd send forth laborers into the harvest. That's what He's talking about here. You have a little strength. There's not many of you. There's a remnant of you. There's only a remnant taking this gospel message to the world around us. You know, and that should, that should uh, tell us as pastors, as, as lay persons, as church members, you know, just because there's 10,000 people going there doesn't make it right. And just because there's only a handful going there doesn't mean that God's not with them. God is with the church in Philadelphia because the church of Philadelphia is that missionary-minded church, that church that's set about taking the gospel. And and they're set about taking it into the doors. God's opened up doors for us here through the prison ministry and other things. God has opened up doors that way that we are able. And we're small in number. But God knows who we are. He knows where we are. He's opening up doors as we can, as we have people, if you will, to to yield to Him to go through those doors, to to do that which He has for us to do. We need to remember that. Whatever it is God has for you to to do, He's going to open up the door and He's going to provide the strength. He's going to provide what it is that you need to go through that door, to walk through that door. You have a little strength, but listen to this. And have kept my word and have not denied my name. He's going to say this twice in this letter to to the church at Philadelphia. You have kept my word. What is? He is the word. He's talking about faith in Christ. He's talking about, you know, a lot of the church will say, Oh, we, we, we still have faith in Christ. But yet they they refer you to their on-staff psychologist when you have a need or whatever's going on. 
or they, they refer you out to a psychologist, or they, 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 they try to say, well, let's look and we'll see what purpose-driven life can. I think this can help you. Won't you read this and follow the love dare thing or whatever it might be? You know, they're, they're directing your faith away from Christ and Him crucified, all the while thinking, and he's going to talk about that here in a minute, all the while thinking that they're part of the church, that they're following after God. You know, we got to be careful. If we're not directing them to Jesus Christ and Him crucified, I think I said this Sunday, He is the answer. He is the only answer. And that's where we have to direct. We don't have to know a whole lot. We don't have to be all, all Scripture knowing and everything. Whenever somebody has a need, we can say Jesus is the need meter. In Him is everything you need for life and godliness. If all you do is say, go to Jesus, pray, seek His face. Put your trust in Him and what He did for us at Calvary and He will take care of that need. Then that's, that is enough because He's enough. We need to understand that. And I know stuff comes our way and we get down and we get, we get kind of a, a in the mully grub sometimes. But we need to understand that if we're pointing them to Jesus, that's the best place we could point. We could come up with 10 million things to say, 10 million words to speak, and it do nothing for them. But when we point them to Jesus, it does everything. It meets the need. Point them to Jesus no matter what, you, what it is. He says, you have a little strength and have kept my word and have not denied my name. I got a red note on that, so we better read that note. <clears throat> the ver oh, yes. Have not, and that's this point straight to Calvary. The very name Jesus means Savior, which refers to what He did at the cross. Christ means anointed or Messiah, the anointed Savior. That's His very name in and of itself speaks of, of Calvary. It says, to properly hold the name of Christ is to properly understand the cross. And in effect, to ignore or deny the cross is to ignore or deny the name. I'm going to read that again because we need to hear that. To properly hold to the name of Christ is to properly understand the cross. The name of Christ, the anointed Savior. And in effect, to ignore or deny the cross is to ignore or deny the name of Jesus. To ignore... There's a lot of churches today that don't outright repudiate the cross. There are some that do, but they just push it aside. They take the cross off the building. They don't mention the cross. Because, oh, that might offend somebody. You're ignoring. You're denying His name when we do that. They have not denied. They have kept my word and have not denied my name. Hmm. You see, we need to reflect a little on that. Are we keeping His Word? How do we keep His Word? By keeping our faith in Christ. How do we keep His name? How to not deny His name? By keeping our faith in Christ. It's just that simple. He says, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan. We need, there's some pretty telling things here in this letter. I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. So, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan. Satan's temple. This is how the Lord is describing those who preach another gospel. Who add to... We need to hear this. We need to get this. Those who add to Christ and Him crucified, whether it's purpose-driven or government of twelve or your confession, whatever it might be. I mean, I, there's 101 things in the church today that we could really bring out here. But anybody who adds to the message of the cross what Jesus did, the gospel, what Jesus did for us at Calvary, anybody who adds to that anything at all 
Jesus sees them as belonging to the synagogue of Satan. They are anti-Christ. All the while. He said, listen what he says here. He says, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews. Now to understand that, we've got to understand, this is not just referring to people who claim to be Jewish. These are, this is proclaiming to be, or, or this is talking about people who claim the name of Jesus, claim that they worship Jehovah, claim that they are, are believers, because that's what that word, the Jews, that, that's what that's talking about. I looked that up. It talks about uh, those who claim to be of the faith, but in reality are not. They teach some other doctrine and promote law-keeping over or along with faith in Christ. The Judaizers of Galatians are an example. That's just a note I wrote there. But as I looked up that word Jews, it spoke of anybody, whether they were of the ten tribes or the twelve tribes or not, that it came back from the exile or whatever, that observed the law of Moses, they became known as the Jews. But then Paul would speak about those, who are, are, those that are uh, uh, Jews inwardly and not outwardly only. What he's talking about though, those, this is referring to those who claim to have faith in who Christ is and what Christ did for us at Calvary. We know a lot of folks that claim that faith. But yet they go about teaching things. They go about bringing in other things, other doctrines, other things. Oh, this is going to help. Psychology is a help. We can bring... No, we can't. As a believer, we either trust exclusively in Christ and Him crucified alone, or we don't. And what, Je what He's saying, what Jesus is saying here is, those who teach anything else are of the synagogue of Satan. They are Satan's ministers. Hmm. Hear that. That's what he's saying here. Get down into this word, pastor, preacher, evangelist. If you're holding to your psychology degree and trying to marry it with the gospel, you're of the synagogue of Satan. You're teaching heresy. It's time to repent. God in His love is giving you space and time to repent as He told them up there with Jezebel. Mm. You can hate me later, I don't care. It's in the Word. Your quarrel, it ain't with me. It's His Word, it's not me. I'm not telling you this because it's something I thought up or because I think this. That's in the Word. He identifies those teaching another doctrine as the synagogue of Satan. He says they're not Jews. They're not Jews inwardly. They're not Jews outwardly. Go do a study on that. Look at what Paul said. You know, not all of Israel are Israel. You know, you're, you're considered a worshiper of Jehovah. That's what a Jew was which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Anything that's not Christ in Him. What did you know, he say up here? He that is true, he that is holy, anything outside of Christ in Him crucified is not truth. It's not holy. It's a lie. Anything added to the end of the book of Revelation here is going to talk about to him that adds to or takes away the words of this prophecy, well, I will add to him the, the, the plagues, the judgments of this prophecy. Mm. Be careful, preacher. Be careful, little ears, what you hear, little eyes, what you see. He says, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet. Now, don't get the big head. This doesn't mean they're going to worship you. What this means is we're going to be in the presence of God. We're going to be there with Christ. And we're, they're, going to, they're going to see you and know you because you told them at one time or another to repent and they did not. The, the Word of God says, Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We are going to be there 
When every knee, I don't care who you are, I don't care how prideful you are in your lifestyle, it doesn't matter. You will bow before the name and before the feet of Jesus Christ and you will say, you are Lord. The devil himself is going to bow and say, you are Lord. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. And that's what he's talking about here. In his presence... And we will be in His presence. They're not going to worship us. But we're going to see them and they're going to see us as they bow before Jesus Christ. Because He alone deserves all the glory and all the praise. Here I will make them to come and worship before Thy feet and to know mm, 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 that I have loved you. Only here and in the next little bit here in Laodicea do we see that where Jesus says, I have loved you. We know He loves us. But He's going to, the whole bunch of them, they're going to know that He actually did love, that we were actually preaching His message. Then He says, verse 10, Because you have kept the word of my patience, I also will keep you. This is, I guess the paramount scripture, if you want to call it that, for a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Because you have kept the word of my patience, I also will keep you from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. I will keep you because you have... What does it mean? I, you have kept the word of my patience. That, that, that keeping the word of his patience means to... Pres persevere it's a bearing up under or an endurance to things or circumstances because you have not quit you have persevered and kept the word what is, who is the word Jesus Christ that goes right back to Calvary because his name says who he is and what he did for us you have kept the word of my patience you have been patient you have endured under that tells us we're going to have trials. We're going to have tribulations. We're going to have times of testing. But don't quit. Be steadfast. He's going to say it in verse 11. Hold fast. He says, I will also keep you. Keep watch, keep guard from. That word from means out of. Mm. Out of the out. It doesn't mean he's going to preserve you through it. He could do that as well. But He's going to keep us out. He's going to take us out of here before that time comes upon the earth. I will also keep you from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. He said, Behold. Mm, lots of beholds here. Behold, I come quickly. Hmm. 2,000 years ago, how much... How much quicker do you think He's coming? I come quickly. Hold fast. Be steadfast. We see that in several of these letters. Hold on to what you have. Don't let anybody beguile you. Don't let anybody take from you that which you have. Hold fast that faith. Hold fast that which you have. That no man take thy crown. If it were not possible, it wouldn't be written here. It is possible that you can be deceived, be led astray, and lose that which you have. Another nail in the coffin of Calvinism, if you will, or that uh, once saved, always saved teaching. I come quickly. Hold fast. Hold that fast which thou hast. Hold that, hang on to it tenaciously, don't let it go. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Then again, he that overcometh, there is victory in Christ. Will I make a pillar in the temple of my God? That's referring to the two pillars that sat in front of Solomon's temple. These pillars, incidentally, they don't hold up anything. They were for decoration only. I was doing some reading on that. They were like uh, 13 feet or so tall, and they were wrapped with all kinds of ornamentation and pomegranates and all kinds of beautiful splendor. And, and 
understand this too. You know, there are a lot of people that will say, you know, when children of Israel came out of Egypt, that the Egyptians gave them all kinds of things, gold and, and, and silver and all kinds of things like that, monetary goods. You know, and they'll say, well, and they'll, they'll try to use that and say, well, oh, it's okay to borrow from the world and take the things of the world and make them Christian. That's not what that means. Because these, these pillars in the temple of God, this was brass and silver and, 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 and just the, the precious metals that David had, had taken from these heathen kings and he had laid them up in store. But understand this. See, the, these, these things that were taken, this, this one heathen king, I think, uh, I can't remember exactly what it was, but his name meant something like, uh, something to do with Satan and Satan's power. And see, David as a type of Christ, he went in and he took these things from it. It's a picture of our salvation is what it is. We were under the dominion and the, the, the authority, the power of Satan. But Christ came in, our heavenly David came in, paid the price and redeemed us. And as David took this, this brass and silver and gold and all these things from these heathen kings, he laid them up in store for the time that the temple would be built. God has you laid up in store. God has got you in a place where He's working on you. He's going to make of you the one who used to be in heathen bondage, who used to be under the dominion of the enemy. He has taken you out and He's laid you up in store preparing you. You see, in this time where Solomon made the, the or was building the temple, I think, I forgot the guy's name, but he was a craftsman and all that stuff. He went out into the desert and he dug molds out of the sand and they took that, the, that, that brass and all that, that precious metals and they melted it down. we got to be melted sometimes. Refiner's fire. Mm, Lord, cleanse me. Burn up the dross. The Holy Spirit is, the, a type of the Holy Spirit is fire. He'll come in and burn up the drug. We don't take the things of the world and say, Oh, here we go, there are things of God now. Not without the Holy Spirit coming in and burning up all the dross and taking the sin out. Mm. You see, that's the picture. That's the analogy of, this temp of, of, of these pillars in the temple. Those pillars, they say, they were erect, erected like 13 feet tall. And they would polish them things every day. And then every day it was a spectacle or a, 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 splendor, a splendid thing. People that would travel from all over the world to come to Jerusalem would camp outside of Jerusalem the night before. And as the sun came up on those pillars in the, in the, uh, in the morning time, it would reflect the glory of the sun off those pillars. We are to reflect the glory of Jesus Christ as the Holy Spirit comes in and every day he's got to spit shine you if you will. He's got to do some rubbing on you. He's got to do some clean because we get tarnished throughout the day. And they're pillars but they're not. We ain't holding nothing up. You see that's a picture that God don't have to have you. He don't, you're not supporting nothing. You're not holding anything up. You're there for decoration. You're there to, to reflect the glory of Jesus Christ. Let him, let his glory be reflected in you. He that overcomes will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God. Mm -mm. My name Woody, I got Andy on my, no, uh-uh. God's got that name on me. Amen. Because I am his and he is mine, that song says. His banner over me is love. I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. There's a new name written down in glory. And it's mine. And there ain't nobody going to know that name but you and God. You know, you know that, that's amazing. God knows every star. He knows every hair. And He's going to have a different name for every last one of us. And whenever He says, Hey, whatever. Yeah, here I am, I'm coming. And only you 
I think we, we I kind of brought this up here a while back. There's, there's 10 billion Tommies in the world. God ain't saying, Tommy. He's going to have a special name that only you and him know. So when, when he calls my name, I'll be, was that, I'll be somewhere, somewhere listening. Somewhere, somewhere listening. When he calls my name, mm, he's going to call your name one day. And you know what? That name's going to be written down in that book. It's going to be written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. I think that's going to be the name he talks about here. Is that new name that we're given. He says, he that has an ear, do you have an ear? Are you listening? Do you want to hear? This is an awesome little letter right there. We all want to hear that. Oh, yeah. But we also need to understand, are we part of the synagogue of Satan? Are we teaching something else? Or are we remaining steadfast in our faith in Christ? He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. We'll pick up Church of Laodicea next week. Don't miss it. We'll have it up on YouTube a few days after the, after the service. I hope this has blessed you this evening. I hope you've gained some insight, some understanding that you may not have, have seen before. Go back and study it some more. Do some word studies. You know, Get you uh, uh, some good commentary and study it and just see what the Lord will have to say to you because He wants to speak to each and every one of us. Are we willing to listen? Are we willing to hear? Amen? Amen. Father, I'm asking in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would walk with your people the rest of this week, Lord. Father, walk with us. Lead us. Guide us, Father. Bring us back here on Sunday, Lord, that we might worship and praise you, Father, and give glory and honor to your name, Lord. I thank you and I give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.